thank you for, yep, we want to, we want to thank you for joining us because we know that you could be doing anything else with the next 60 minutes and the fact that you're here with us is not lost on us and we really appreciate the time that you're taking to be here with us so we are going to record these calls and the reason why we're recording them is that we put these out on our podcast and social platform snippets of them so that we can or all in their entirety so that we can spread the word about what we're doing. And we want to try to help as many people as possible to be playing tennis pain-free. And so us being a community is a part of that. Um, if you're not comfortable sharing your likeness or your contribution, just feel free to put your question or um, your contribution into the chat and we will do our best to make sure that we accommodate that and address that. Otherwise, we appreciate you um, participating and sharing yourselves with not only each other and us, but like the entire community. So I just wanted to start with that. And um, uh, the other thing is if you're going to uh, participate, which we highly encourage, just please make sure that you're in a quiet and distraction-free place so you can do that so that we can all get a clear uh, signal and listen carefully to what you're saying um, is great. But if not, then just go ahead and pop it in the chat as well. So that's it. And I'm going to hand it over to Nick. Thank you for joining so, us again. Yeah, thanks, Ruth. Yeah, so I think, and also I think we want this to be really fun and playful. I think there's plenty of us probably sitting in front of screens way too much. And, and the last thing we want is to this to be a, a boring Zoom uh, interaction. So we're, we're definitely going to, you know, be teaching a little bit and, and trying to give you guys some sort of some knowledge and tools and stuff. But, but really, we want this to be kind of interactive and we want it to be fun and we want it to be playful. And so we're actually going to start uh, with a quick little like icebreaker, and we're we're going to go around thirty seconds each, either favorite U.S. Open tennis moment from this last tournament or why you love tennis. Um, thirty seconds each. We'll keep it quick. We'll keep it brief. I will start. Um, ben Shelton, Francis Tiafo, quarterfinal match. I just thought the energy was was amazing, and to see those two guys make it that far was, was, was really cool. So that was kind of the highlight for me to just, just watch that sort of different level of, of tennis being brought, um, especially American tennis that's been, uh, you know, dormant for, for, for decades and more. So, uh, and then Coco Goff winning. So I have two in there. That was pretty special. So I'll pass it to Ruth. Yeah. And I think I'll go with the why I love tennis. So uh, I recently in the last three years overcame a lot of injuries in order to um, trust my body more. And through tennis, not only am I developing a really nice, cohesive sense of community with the people in my community where it's been pretty tough to do that over the last years, um, but also just I, I learned so much about myself and how to become a better person. And I can't believe that I'm learning all of that through like chasing that little fuzzy ball around and um, trying to improve my backhand. And so I just really love the aspect of play and also growth, the personal growth that comes from participating in tennis. So Maybe we go on a volunteer basis, or would you want us to just call call on yeah, you? Yeah, let's, then... let's call them out, Ruth. You call, and then the next person ah. calls the other person. I think that's easiest. All right. Okay. How about Alex? I want to hear from Alex. All right. Great. Uh, yeah. Nice to be here. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. And uh, I'm not in a totally distraction-free zone, so I'll just put my video off if I have to like be distracted and. I'm going with the Coco Golf like turnaround moment. I thought I had turned it on just as she was turning on around the match. Um, and that was, it was pretty amazing to see how she kind of like stayed in and like just showed up and stayed in all those points. Good to be. I agree. That's great. Stephanie, Alex, I'll, uh, Steph and Alex, I'll pass it to you guys. Oh, another Alex. Yeah. Oh, another one. Two Alexes. Hi, everybody. Um, my favorite moment from the U.S. Open was the match between Alcaraz and Medvedev. I thought that it was just absolutely amazing. Even though I really, really wanted Alcaraz to win because he's my favorite. Seeing how Medvedev played in that match was unbelievable. His his backhand shot down the line was so inspiring. <laughs> um, 
And I really enjoyed seeing the post-match interviews and, and hearing the players speak. Um, I never really knew how cool Medvedev was until really the U.S. Open and hearing him talk and, and then exploring um, him more. He's a really cool guy that supports a lot of other players. Um, I love tennis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my most memorable moment from the U.S. Open, I think, was there was one highlight we watched of Alcaraz and, and Dan Evans, I think, and they had one point that was like, normally you might get like a three or four, like, whoa, didn't think they were going to get that, didn't get, think they were going to get that, but there was like 10 in that point, and I was just like mind blown how how insane both of them were moving and covering the, the court. <laughs> so Absolutely. Cool. I love Dan Evans. He's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Amy? there so as far as uh, the u.s open i've only recently gotten acquainted through this kind of new com tennis community that i'm in um, who's playing i don't really watch tv um but hearing them talk about it with such excitement so i've actually more so watched um um some of like the uh, like the youtube reels things a little bit um comprehensive about what's going on and really what i admire most about what i've just heard of some of them um you know giving their uh, I think Steffi had said this, um, their composure and when they're talking about um, going through the match in their mind. So, um, you know, like with Coco Golf, re friend recently saw her in Atlanta playing. And so that's how I came to have an idea of her. Anyways, um, I watched her acceptance speech. And so to me that that was really motivational. And um, I joined this particular, um, what, I, what, I, what I like about tennis, um, again, it's like the camaraderie, but having to um have you recently gotten some injuries so want to hear about how to prevent those particularly to tennis help hi heather awesome um did we lose you for a second yep maris i heard, how tennis, about I heard you? tennis elbow and then a cut so right at the punchline but we'll get we'll definitely get to, to that um christian and heather i don't know if christian you're available to chat if so unmute yourself yeah there you go Hey guys, yeah, sorry, can't be on camera. Uh, I like it when Novak hung up the phone. I thought that was awesome. <laughs> that was so funny. Uh, but mostly, I just love tennis for the people I meet and the mental growth that it that it provides. So cool stuff, guys. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Maurice. I'll pass it to you, and then Heather, you're on deck. And yeah, Heather so just joined us. We're just going around, uh, Heather, and just sharing um, either a favorite US Open moment or or um, why you love to play tennis. Maurice, go ahead. Yes, why I love to play tennis. I'm going to answer that one. Uh, well, because I love to play with the capital P with uh, all my friends here, which I really love. Uh, I do spend a lot of time behind the screen. So getting outside, being on the, on 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 the court is just really really nice and uh, and fun. And I'm turning forty, so I really hope to stay pain free uh, as long as possible. So I'm curious to hear more. Everybody's turning forty. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Nick, Nick, just for the record, I don't have I don't have like hosting, so I can't help with the back end admin stuff. Just so you know. Yeah, got you. Thanks. Hey, Heather, go for it. Okay. Um, my name's Heather, and I've been playing tennis for only about a year and a half. So um, to me, it's another sport that I have under my belt. I love exercise. I love team sports. Um, and I just love all types of exercise. So um, I'm actually over 50, pushing 50 and a half. <laughs> so I would like to play as long as I can. And I love seeing um, all the different ages that can play tennis out there and stay fit. Go Heather. Yes, <laughs> agree with that. So, um, Con, um, you weren't here for the housekeeping part. If you want to show, if you want to share your beautiful face with us, we'd love to see it. And we're just sharing about favorite U.S. Open moment or why you love playing tennis. And so, if you can, uh, if you want to unmute yourself and show us your face, you're not obligated, but it certainly helps us get to know each other. Yeah, um, I'm kind of have a hard time to turn on my uh, beautiful face. <laughs> <laughs> but um, 
So, um, yeah, I uh, I enjoy tennis. Um, it makes me feel stronger. I meet new people. Um, and, you know, I see two people in here that I know of. So that's awesome. Uh, currently, I don't really have uh, foot issues, but I'm interested to hear the different cases come up. All right, cool. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's everybody. So awesome, guys. Thanks for being here. We'll just quickly introduce, I know about half people in this room, so so I will take about 20 or 30 seconds each. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Nick Holt. I am a personal trainer and also a health coach. I live here in Tamarindo, Costa Rica. Um, I've been teaching on and off tennis for over 20 years. I, I primarily work with, with men and help them sort of move, feel, and, and look better. Uh, I also work with some kids here in person to, with the tennis academy here. And, and so, you know, I think our value, Ruth and myself, is really not our, our expertise. We do have a lot of that, probably decades and decades of it. But it's really our sort of like struggles through our issues that we've been able to sort of solve. And I, I still have some back pain that I deal with, Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis stuff that, that comes up. And it, it's, it's, you know, we've... We've been on our experiments and our journeys, and, and we're just really excited to share what we've learned. Um, and I'll pass it to Ruth to give you a quick background on her. Yeah. So I'm Ruth O'Donnell. I'm in the United States in Mobile, Alabama. And my background is in kinesiology, and I um, am a generalist. I have been in the, in the human movement industry for over 30 years. And I was also a college um, intercollegiate um, basketball player and I played all sports growing up. As a result of an ACL tear, uh, well, multiple ankle sprains, as you can imagine, in basketball and volleyball and softball, um, eventually I think uh, laid the fertile ground for an ACL tear, which I then had a reconstruction and a pretty failed rehab, I would say. So over the years, though, I tried to stay active. I was always in pain and um, so about three years ago, I found a company um, that I love and work for now called the Foot Collective. And I work as an internal um, part of the leadership team there, helping people from all over the world, including health professionals, learn about um, the, the role that our feet play as the foundation and how our, the strength and the mobility and the resilience of our feet actually travel upstream in order to set the groundwork for what's happening up the kinetic chain. So um, I'm able to play tennis when I probably, if you asked me three years ago, if I were to play competitive sports at all, I would have said, no, I was giving up on that. So I'm really happy to be here and share. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Ruth. Yeah. So I, I want to just start, we're going to just go through a quick overview of what we're trying to do here. Um, but I love to, I love this quote from George Bernard Shaw, and it's talking about play. And it's, we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. Right. And I think tennis is one of these things where there's so many of us that just love it so much, but we have nagging injuries, maybe issues that we haven't dealt with in the past that are sort of creeping up and don't allow us to, to play as, as much. And really that that was kind of the, the genesis of this. And Ruth and I were, are in this beautiful community, as she mentioned, the Foot Collective. And there's, you know, we've noticed in our tennis community, so many people want to be playing more, but they're limited by Achilles injuries or foot issues or knee issues or low back stuff. And so you know, we came together to to sort of create this, um, this what's I think going to be a digital product and and a service for people. And we're we're really just having this call to to share our vision and also to get some some feedback um, for, from you guys because I think one of the key pieces that we're trying to really create is is this idea of of a community and that you know Ruth and I certainly are are experts in this in this world, but you know we're all doing this together and we all can share uh, practices and tools and techniques and, and things that have worked for you. And we can build this like beautiful community together. So that's really what we're trying to do. Um, and what I'm going to do is just go over maybe five to 15 minutes of some, some teaching stuff about the body, about the foot. I know people here have, have sort of come with specific issues. I've um, plantar fasciitis seems to be the, the, the one that, 
has popped up the most. Tennis elbow, probably right behind that. Um, and so I'm just going to share for a few minutes. Um, and Ruth and I will kind of go back and forth, um, just talking about what sort of what we've learned over our sort of decade, you know, decades of of working in this space and and learning about the body and how it relates specifically um, to to tennis. So did I miss anything, Ruth? Or is that no, I think um, I think that's it. And then just the rest of the format of the call will be some sharing and we'll then we're going to solicit some feedback from you mm -hmm. all as well. So so if you have questions and stuff, we'll definitely include that into the format. Cool. Yep. OK, so to start, I think it's really important to just talk about a couple sort of core principles that these core truths that we talk that, that are really important. And, and there's basically three of them. Um, and the first two are, are pretty straightforward, and, and it's that the body is this incredible self-healing and self-organizing system, right? So if we come from this perspective that the body has this incredible intelligence, it's evolved over hundreds of thousands or millions of years, and a lot of times it's just kind of getting out of the way um, of the body's innate wisdom, it, and, and a lot of times that solves a lot of these issues that we have. And the third principle is this idea of the what's called the said principle, which is really, really powerful. And that just means in the scientific world, specific adaptations to impose demands. Right. Another way to say that is that the body adapts very specifically to the demands that we place on it. Right. So the outputs are directly tied to the inputs. Now, how this is, plays out practically. Right. If you sit a lot in our modern environment, we're going to become really good sitters right so we're not going to develop the strength the mobility the uh, capacity to get into certain positions right um there's a beautiful book that i that i highly recommend uh ruth and i talk about this book all the time it's called move your dna by katie bowman and we can email it to you or pop it in the chat here um and you see this across the animal kingdom too she has this beautiful example in the book uh, talking about orcas in the wild and how when you have orcas that are in captivity, like in SeaWorld or other environments where they're not able to roam free, they actually lose their their uh, their dorsal fin, like because they're, they're they're used to traveling hundreds and hundreds of miles a day to to forage and to eat, and when they're in captivity, they basically their body no longer. Um, allocates resources to that fin and they end up having this what's called floppy fin syndrome. And so it really is one of these principles of like, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? That's the said principle. And we can apply this to really anything. So it's really powerful. Um, even something like plantar fasciitis, which is can be quite complex. If we understand the body is self-healing, the body is self-organizing, it just adapts to the inputs that you you give it, we understand that most of plantar fasciitis is just kind of an overload, overuse issue. So that tissue, the plantar fascia, which is the fascia connective tissue on the bottom of your foot, just gets overloaded. And so a lot of times that's because the foot isn't properly functioning and we can't have a foot conversation without having a hip conversation. A lot of the times the hips aren't doing their job to stabilize the foot the foot can't stabilize. And so the fascia just takes on a lot more stress and it gets overloaded. And that's what creates this plantar fasciitis. And itis just means like an inflammation of that tissue, right? So elbow tendonitis, um, tennis elbow, same thing. It's the inflammation of that, um, that tendon. Achilles tendonitis, same thing. It's the inflammation of that tissue. So again, really important. And I think if you take nothing else away from this call, just like the set principle, um, applying that to most everything is, is just a really powerful lens to, to look at the human body and to look at health and to look at pain. Um, anything you want to add to that, Ruth? Yeah, I mean, I think like just um, referring to like specific examples in our lives, you know, um, specific adaptations to impose demands can be as, as simple as like whatever, like Nick was saying, whatever you give your body, it will adapt and respond to. So even with when you think about like tennis elbow um, or any itis or angry tissue, not only is it overuse, but I, I find that sometimes we forget about like thinking about our whole body as one organism, one unit, 
And so we tend to compartmentalize every injury, right? And so we, if it's the elbow, we automatically think it's a problem with the elbow and it is, but there's a real chance, like, like we were saying with the, the feet, um, if the feet, you know, have all these wonderful, uh, this wonderful architecture to do the job to navigate us through the world and to support us and all of the demands that we place on it, the same holds true for um, the hands and the elbows. And if you're not moving your upper body in a way that's like supple, you know, like if you're not dancing or moving your torso or ro rotating, that is going to, you're not going to be able to like dispel the forces through the kinetic chain. So anything that we talk about that has to do with inputs from the feet up also has to do from the top down as well. So anything at the bottom is going to, that you give inputs up the chain, the same holds true for down the chain. Yeah. But yeah, perfect, Ruth. And, and so like when we're talking, when we apply this to tennis, obviously our feet are what get us around the court, right? So, so you know, we have to talk around um, proper, you know, foot, foot mechanics and that leads into a, 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 naturally leads into a sneaker conversation. And that's all the sort of, there's so much um, stuff just packed into, into foot mechanics, into sneakers. And so we're going to dive into all that when we eventually sort of develop out a, a, a you know, a platform and a community and a course. Um, but this principle, this, the set principle is really, really important. And so as we, as it relates to tennis, you know, we have to understand that tennis and really any sport for that matter, we're not really evolutionarily sort of designed to do a lot of these movements that tennis requires, right. To, start and stop, to go lateral, to go to twist, to turn. And so um, to rotate the spine, um, to, you know, arm, go, lift your arm over your head, to rotate the hips, all these positions that you need to um, get into in tennis, a lot of times people don't have that movement capability. And then what happens is certain tissues um, get overloaded and it leads to, to, to pain and injury. So understanding what tennis requires as far as mobility of the of the spine, really good foot mechanics, um, good rotation through the hips, good shoulder uh, range of motion, all these things. Um, you can start to address certain issues in your body if you don't have those particular ranges of motion that could be causing your tennis elbow, your Achilles tendonitis, your plantar fasciitis. So a lot of times, like Ruth was saying, you know, it's not necessarily the where the pain is, is showing up. It's not necessarily the cause, right? So a lot of times, yes, you might have inflammation and damage to that tennis, el that, that tendon on the elbow, but, and you need to probably address that and give it recovery and rest. But what's causing that might be your shoulder or wrist. Um, a lot of times, if you look above and below the joint, generally you'll start to find sort of limitations um, that are occurring there that are putting extra stress on on the the joint that's that has the the damage. Um, and I'll just I'll just add to that one of the things that we talk about a lot in our work and in our play is that you know, Nick mentioned like the demands of tennis are pretty intense, right? So like we do have all these capabilities to rotate and move and lift and twist. But I think where as tennis players, we start to have issues is that we we talk about earning the right to do those, those particular movements in our tennis matches. And um, as we go on, you'll see the kinds of shoes that I wear are considered are called natural footwear. So I wear like toe pocket shoes with no arch support and very little cushion. And um, I'm learning to earn the right to move my body in certain ways on the tennis court. But if we don't, if we haven't earned those positions off of the tennis court in our daily lives, then we're gonna run into real problems when we start to play tennis. And that's where injury, I think that's where fertile ground for injury, long-term injury in recreational tennis players. It's a little different, I think, I'm, I think it ends up all being the same injury wise on the tennis court, because whether you're a professional elite athlete or you're a recreational 3.0 player, um, it all tends to be the same is that we haven't really earned that right. And then we might be overusing those um, mechanics or repetitively doing that motion without really recovering well or 
earning the foundation from that in the beginning. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for adding that, Ruth. Because really pain, like if we talk about pain for a few minutes, pain is really a, a, a beautiful teacher. If, if you th It's a signal from the body. Now, uh, and so, you know, I think Ruth and I would be on the same page. If you're in, you know, a, a, the common um, issue I get where people share is like, oh, I feel like I got hit by a car after I play tennis. And it's like, if your body is completely you know, banged up after playing tennis to Ruth's point, like there's, you probably haven't earned the right to either play that much tennis or you're just overdoing it a little bit. And so pain is one of these things where it's a beautiful teacher. Um, unfortunately in our, in our culture, you know, pain is something that's, that's avoided and we take ibuprofen or we take drugs to, to mask the pain. Um, but if you really think about pain, it's it's a signal from the body. And what normally starts as a little whisper, a subtle hint like, hey, you know, there's something going on in the shoulder. If you ignore it, it generally will will only get worse and start to scream at you. And then it could lead to something that's quite debilitating. So pain is something that we really need to lean into and, and start to almost in, instead of try to ignore it and push it away is to become more curious with it. I think that's a really good um, sort of way that we talk about it um, in our communities is, is, is what can you learn from pain? Why is that pain there? Um, because, you know, and this is quite controversial or this is, this, this is taking a real stance because this is taking ownership of, of your health and your body. And we're not outsourcing that to a physio or a PT or a doctor who, you know, was just going to sort of fix and manage symptoms. So of course, I think there are moments where if you have an injury, it makes sense to go to a doctor, to an orthopedic, to a physio, to a PT. But my experience has been, and I'm sure Ruth can share her experience as well, so many of these issues is just about understanding why the pain's there and trying to experiment to understand why it's there and trying to do things to address some of those limitations that might be causing it um, and not and not masking it. And I think, you know, there was a Netflix special um, break point, and I'm sure many of you have have seen it. There was a, the, the scene with Taylor Fritz. Uh, I think it was last year or two years ago at the um, Indian Wells tournament. And I think he was about to play Rafa in the finals and he hurt his ankle and, and he ended up getting like shot up with a bunch of drugs so he could play. And, and like he was, he, he won and he won a master's 1000, I think probably biggest win of his career. But if we look at it from the lens of, of like health span and longevity of his ability to play tennis for 20, 30, 40 years, I would say he probably, um, you know, did a lot more damage than, than good in that situation. Now, if I was in that situation, I might make that same trade-off because he's worked his whole life to get to that point. But this is ultimately a conversation that you need to, or a decision you need to make. But I think it's powerful to understand, um, you know, there's trade-offs there. And when you, mat when you, when we take drugs, shots, ibuprofen, we're really masking that, that signal that our body is sending us. Um, yeah. Pain is, pain is, a, is tricky and elusive, right? And I think um, in my experience, what I've noticed is that we tend to override because we want to be productive and we want to continue living our lives and continue with the responsibilities and the play and all the things. And the biggest thing I've noticed about pain is going slow, like taking a long-term mindset, which nobody wants to hear ever, <laughs> but it really has been the most uh, healing thing I've seen, not only in myself and other people. And that means like always going back to the most simple um, principles, first principles and the said principle, but first principles thinking, taking a long-term mindset and remembering that Pain is, uh, we, I mean, ultimately we are a nervous system sensing organisms that are, and our nervous system is designed to keep us out of pain. And for chronic pain, which is very interesting to me, 
um, not being afraid of it. Like Nick said, Nick used the phrase of like leaning into it, which we're not really that keen to do, but, um, and we can't do that if the symptoms are suppressed and not, I mean, I, I think like with the exception of sleep, you know, trying to get a little bit of sleep so that the body can heal, there, there are not that many instances where pain medicine is actually, I think, recommended in my experience. Um, and then with regards to, to Rafa and trade-offs, you know, like I think Nick said, we, we have to make, we have to recognize what the trade-offs are. So if what we want to do is play tennis for many, many years and then interact with our communities of intergener intergenerational ages um, and keep our, our tennis communities healthy and strong, uh, addressing the pain um, is, is like a very important aspect of I think this teaching. Yeah, absolutely. And I think on a very practical level, I think what we would advise and, and sort of a couple of high level tips is to try to get, um, you know, specific and try to qualify the pain because as Ruth was saying, it's very elusive. So just asking yourself questions like, okay, where, where exactly is the pain? Is it sharp or is it dull? Um, you know, as, as a, as a personal trainer and working with people in person, a lot of times someone might have discomfort from doing an exercise and they might feel this, you know, what, what, if anybody's worked out or trained, um, you know, you might feel the discomfort of that, of that muscle fatigue and, and people, some people might think of that as a pain and they have to stop. That's very different that, that sort of muscle fatigue versus like a sharp, pain that's very specific in in sort of a you know in the joint capsule or, or in the joint where bone meets bone um and if something refers down the body or up the body that generally is is something you want to pay attention to um is it like how consistent is it is it when you wake up in the morning is it all day um what's the intensity is it a two out of ten is it a ten out of ten um what movements activities sort of make it worse and what movement activities sort of make it better. And I think when you can start to um, sort of analyze it a little bit better for yourself, you can start to sort of put some pieces together as far as uh, what might the best next step might might that be. And, you know, this, and I think here is room for the physios and the PTs. And really what Ruth and I are trying to do here is, is guide people through a, a you know, a logical path of, of sort of um, solving sort of your own pain issues through these um, through a lot of these experiments that we'll we'll be releasing, and so I think I just, yeah. I just wanted to say one last thing. Um, I didn't know if you were changing subjects, but before we go on, I'm going to say the thing that that people don't really talk about with pain, and that is that like if you have had chronic pain and or an acute injury, um, there are emotional and aspects that come along with traumatizing the body a little bit. And so we, we don't really talk about this so much about like how the body keeps the, truly does keep the score of like the physical injury, but also like the, if you weren't in a really relaxed, easy state of mind when you had the injury and it was a, an emotional or a scary thing or a shocking thing, um, there, we can assess that as well on an ongoing basis. So at, in our work, we're, and we're big fans of like keeping notes and being our own, what we call citizen scientists, like taking notes and doing your experiments and paying attention. And it's not only physical, but like, we're also feeling emotional. You know, we're, we're more than just a body. We're a lot other, of other things and the body stores that. So I think that, that, that it is worth noting about the emotional aspects too, like, you know, like eventually I'll get to tell you about how I fell off my electric scooter, <laughs> but um, it was shocking, you know, like it was really shocking. And, and I had a few tears because of that. And I realized like, I usually am so, um, I want to be tough. And so then I end up, I feel a lot better after I just let myself just kind of either journal about it or some kind of catharsis around the emotional aspects of injury and chronic pain, because it's frustrating and it makes you, there's a little grief involved in there about like not being able to do what you want to do. So I think it's worth um, paying attention to as well. Yeah. Thanks for adding that Ruth. Yeah. I mean, I think pain is wildly complex and so many different variables. Um, and, and the emotional piece is huge. A hundred percent. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about just the 
foot here for a few minutes and then we're going to open it up. Um, but before we go to the foot, is, is all this making sense to you guys? Is there any specific questions on pain or said principle or any specific things that come up and you can just raise your hand or unmute yourself and chime in if so. <clears throat> I wrote down the SAD principle. It's S-A-D. Is that correct? Uh, S-A-I-D. So it's an acronym. Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Yeah. Said um, S-A-I-D. Thanks, Ruth. And it looks like uh, Peter just joined us. So welcome, Peter. Um, if you can participate and have your camera on, great. If not, no worries. We're just going over some high level um, stuff about what we're doing here. So, well, I think this is a good time, Ruth. Why don't you share your, your story about, about your scooter? Because I think the goal, the, one of the real high level goals of what we're trying to do is, is it's not about uh, like avoiding injury, right? I think if we live our lives and we choose to play tennis and we choose to play sports and be active, we are putting ourselves at risk for for getting for getting hurt. And our goal is really for you to be more resilient, to to be to to be able to mitigate injury. Um, I can just share quickly, and then I'm going to have Ruth share a story. But I was playing last week. I was actually have playing against Alex, uh, not my brother Alex, but other Alex there with Steffi. And I hit a serve, and there was a tennis ball on the court. And I was being kind of lazy. I saw the ball on the court, but I didn't really think much about it. Played the point, ended up, Alex did a great lob. I went back to get it and I stepped on the ball and I and I can and I jammed my my big toe and I had the sprained toe, kind of a turf, what's called the turf toe, just a sprained toe. Um, but it could have been way worse, right? It could have been a complete ankle sprain. I could have tore ligaments. There, there could have been a lot more damage that happened. And that's just a quick example of. You know, stuff's going to happen, but if your body has the capacity to be reflexive and to have the strength and stability to adapt to certain things, you're going to be much more robust. And it might just be a, a sprain versus something that's a lot more debilitating. And I'll let Ruth share her example of why it looks like she got in a, a scrap with a feisty cat. <laughs> um. Yes. So Amy DeHart, after our I played with Amy DeHart on Thursday night. And after I ride a, I ride a, an electric scooter, my husband, my partner and I, Matthew have been car free for 15 years. And so I ride my scooter or walk or my bike to the tennis center. And on my way back, it was dark. And um, I love, I love having my little headlight off sometimes because it's beautiful at night and we ride past what I call the beautiful swamp and it's in this park and there's all sorts of beautiful wildlife and stuff. So, and we're in a city, you know, but it's very, it's, there's a lot of nature around. So I had my headlight off and my, my husband, Matthew was riding his scooter in front with his headlight on. And normally I, I watch his headlight and I hit a pine cone, needless to say. And I flipped over the top of my scooter and it was super, <laughs> I mean, I'm, this is day six and I feel like a million bucks. I can't even tell you compared to the night. Like I thought I broke my nose. I thought I broke my teeth. I thought I had an injury to my elbow, maybe a fracture, but it was okay. And I mean, it sounds horrible when I tell the story, especially to my neighbors who are a little older, have high blood pressure, don't interact with the ground at all. They don't go up and down stairs. They, they may as well, I may as well have like they would have shuttled me to the hospital immediately. Um, I was definitely scared. And my whole point in telling you this is that I, I move and I do what I do in my life so I can feel better now and healthy and play now. And there is inherent risk in that. Now, it's not a great idea to, I mean, I'm not saying like that we should not try to avoid falls, but we live in a stay safe world, you know, where like everybody, everybody, especially with the, with people who are older and even younger people, we don't want to fall. And I'm not saying that we should fall all the time, but what I am saying is that we do well by getting in, interact with the ground more. So we do experiments in ground living. Um, I'm a little bit on the extreme end of the spectrum. I don't even own a couch. We have a ping pong table in my dining room and and instruments. And we I don't love that. So cool. we, don't, we don't own any furniture we got rid of 
the last of our furniture. And so what that means is that my, I don't own a gym membership because I get up and down off the ground regularly. I'm always moving in ways that um, help my body to be stronger so that maybe for somebody else that fall would have been catastrophic. You know, I hit my head really hard and there, but the way I fell was really great because of how comfortable I am with moving and falling on the ground. So, um, yeah, so I guess we, I guess my whole point in talking about this is that like part of what we do is not only like we do, we talk about feet, we talk about the amount of time we spend sitting in chairs and how little and how much we're going away from interacting regularly with the ground beneath us in order to get to know it better. And then when we do take risks, which are inherent in living a good, I think a good lively life, um, the injuries aren't, aren't as, they will be there, I think. Like that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned is that like, I never wanted to get injured again. I was tired of being injured and I still get injured but it's not as bad and I know how to care for myself. And sometimes it is catastrophic and that is life. So I know that doesn't sound optimistic, but you know, it's just how are we gonna live now and how well can we move our bodies and stay strong within the framework of what we're trying to do every day. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Ruth. Yeah, it's, it's just about being more resilient. And I think in not having these, these things that are gonna never really happen be a lot, more of a big like big deal and sideline you for for months and months versus maybe a week and i think if we have the long term <clears throat> perspective um we can sort of do things every day to sort of you know mitigate these injuries um versus you know prevent them and that's that's really our goal so i know i want to stay true to the time uh, at the top of the hour and i want to um get get a little bit of feedback from people and and i'll just share you know the just quickly for about a minute on the foot, because I, I think the foot is one of these things where it's really neglected. And as it relates to tennis, I think the biggest thing that you can do as a tennis player to take care of your feet is wear a more natural shoe. And it doesn't have to be, you can still wear a tennis sneaker, which we'll, we'll get into on maybe our next call on what a natural shoe is versus an unnatural shoe. But just having something that's more toe-shaped um, so it, it's the shape of the toes versus getting pointier at the nose, something that's flat, something that's flexible, um, and something that you can feel the ground. And those are the four F's that we talk about in our community. Um, and we'll talk more at length about the, you know, what to look for in a shoe, but just the, the foot is, is, you know, has 26 bones. It has 33 joints. It's made to move. And when we stuff our feet into shoes that are really rigid and stiff and that are up on a ramp and that squeeze our toes together, it, you know, it really can do not only a lot of damage to the foot, but it has knock on effects to all the way up, up the chain. <clears throat> um, so Ruth put that in the chat. Um, so I appreciate that, Ruth. We'll be diving more into the foot um, as we go along, as we build out these these products and programs, but just the more time you can spend in a natural shoe or spending a little bit of time barefoot is really gonna, gonna provide some, some huge uh, dividends to your body. And you're essentially, you know, you're giving your body the natural, the inputs, um, like we talked about in the said principle. <clears throat> so with that, I know a few people had to drop off a quarter of, um, well, I think we're going to open it up now and, and share a little bit, unless there's anything else, Ruth, that you want to hit on. No. Are you going to, are you going to um, give the prompts for the questions? Yeah, I am. So we'd really love to hear from you guys. And this was kind of the whole idea of this call is to, is to, and you can keep it to about a minute or a minute and a half. So be pretty, if you can be pretty economical with your words, so everybody can have a chance to share but basically it's like, what are you dealing with now um, as far as pain wise? And what have you been trying to do to deal with it? And then the third, so the, that's kind of part one, part A and B. And the second question is, what would you love, like what would get you really excited to show up for in terms of a, a, a digital product, a program? Would it be something in person? Would it be group together? Would it be one-on-one? -on -one? 
what would get you really sort of excited to um, what would, like your dream sort of course and what would like what would that look like to you um yeah like what why what would what would make you excited to participate in a community like this what would you need from it sweet and then i will yeah steph you can jump in if you want um, um i had was experiencing pain in my knees when i was uh playing tennis and uh, doing all activities even sometimes walking um and for the last uh eight days i've been really uh strict about incorporating uh 15 to 30 minutes of uh weight training a day like into like my uh my routine and i've noticed a huge difference in how my knee is feeling and i really think that by strengthening my muscles it's taken away from putting so much pressure and everything into my knee. So I've noticed a huge difference from that. I think it would be really beneficial for a program um, if it was something that we could participate online, like if it was it was, if it was filmed or recorded and then we could sign up for it um, and then participate it with um, a schedule that works for us. We do a lot of online classes and I think that would be um really awesome you guys have a lot of great information thank you so much for this class today cool thanks Steph um I actually had plantar fasciitis not too long ago I mean uh, I didn't really even know what that was until one of our tennis like students said that and then I looked it up and I was like oh man I think that's what I have too because <laughs> I just had a like a pretty pretty sharp pain especially in the mornings when I woke up after playing tennis the day before and uh I did like the foot rolling and a lot of things for like a, a week and a half two weeks and didn't really see any huge differences um but then I actually got acupuncture and she added the electro electric to them and literally after I got acupuncture it, it's been so much better since then so and a really, I was surprised that I only had to go one time and that I felt a noticeable difference after that. So I don't know, whatever she did, it really worked. Um, but uh, in terms of what I think would be beneficial as a course is online videos. We, you know, we're very visual and seeing like a sequence of like, oh, you have a foot issue. Here's a couple of videos on what you can do to help that specific issue or shoulder issue. Video series to me is worth a lot you know i think um being able like a youtube video that you can just re use as a resource that those are always super beneficial to me cool awesome thanks alex thanks guys yeah so i uh a couple months ago started to have pain in my uh, wrist which was really new for me and it was because i was focusing a lot on the top spin and playing way more than ever before, like two, three times a week. So just this movement all the time, quite intensively, I think it just overdid it a little bit. So my way of, um, yeah, responding was basically just, you know, uh, pull back a little bit in the intensity and the frequency and just being a little more gentle about it, but also really mindful because like you mentioned with emotions or, you know, how we react also with our thoughts. I think it all, you know, works together. So I was sort of just trying to not keep it too stiff, but also not overdo it with mobility. A friend told me like, well, I just sort of warm up my wrists before rather than trying to not move it and put it in a, in a, in a, in, in something like that would hold it straight. So I was sort of, yeah, trying out these different things and actually moving it just sort of helped me warm up. I think, you know, um, the wrist and then play a little bit more mindful and, and a little bit less. Um, I also sometimes have on and off pain in my knees. And then again, it's very much often for me, depends on how my posture is, uh, whether I'm mindful about how I'm walking around. And I think also when my shoes are start to be too old, uh, I know I, I need to change them. So uh, for me, and of course, um, really tennis related, I, what I tend to do with tennis, I just, go meet my friends and boom, we play tennis. And then when I'm done, I'm like, okay. And I jump in the car and it's done and I don't stretch or warm up or don't have a little routine. 
So that could be really helpful. I always see on the beach, you know, people when they go surfing, they do a little, you know, some movements that are helpful for a surfing or when I played uh, hockey on the field um, at a high level, we always had a little routine before and after. I'm like, why don't we do that with tennis? It's quite weird because it's really <laughs> quite intense, you know, you just go full in. Um, yeah, other than that, I don't have specific ideas. I like the one that Alex just mentioned. I think that's a really nice, nice idea. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, great, great. Yeah, warm ups, cool downs, uh, especially as we get older, so, so vital. And, and I'm, you know, I don't, 100% always do them because it's, it's not fun or it's not, it's not exciting, but it is for sure uh, a vital piece of the longevity equation. So awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, Amy, and then I'll go to you, Heather, after that. So on the court, um, running in my feet doesn't bother me at all. But since maybe I'm over 50, when I get up in the mornings, they're rather painful and super stiff. The only thing I could think of is, well, maybe tennis and the frequency that I play, you know, something's going on where it'll it'll wear off fairly soon, half an hour or so. But I just think it's related. So maybe I need to incorporate more stretches, um, things that even when I'm like laying down, rest myself a little bit better and then maybe be a little slower to to wake up and move. I kind of instantly go for the slippers just because they're softer than being on the hardwood floor. Um, uh, I think that for me, incorporating probably more barefoot um, walking can help. And um, what I really deal with more so, my video cut off earlier, so I'm not sure if you heard, um, tennis elbow. And what I noticed, this kind of ties in with Mary's like maybe mindfulness in our thoughts, is that when I'm practicing serves by myself, I notice that's when I hurt the most. Um, so learning to play in a, in a better way, um, you know, I don't, I don't really with partners, hurt myself as much as by myself. So I think it's a mental thing that I'm doing and over, over killing the ball. So um, techniques, and then I think um, like videos and, and stretching. I'm, I've looked this up before, but I'm not diligent about doing all the stretches on my own off the court. I typically do it before the beat on the court. Great feedback. Thank you. Maybe Heather and then Khan. Yep. Okay, sure. Um, I have a unique situation where I actually have an autoimmune disease where my body produces way too much collagen. And so my muscles get super sore anyway. Um, I'm like constantly stiff. So keeping, you know, busy and active is huge for me. But, you know, so I'm on, I have, I have to deal with pain every day and have for probably 20 years. Um, and so you kind of get, like you said, your body adjusts, your body also adjusts to pain when it's chronic. So, um, so I have a different level of pain when I get an injury, <laughs> like, um, when I was over the summer playing tennis more than usual, and we don't usually serve a lot when we're playing tennis in the groups I play with here. And I was playing Alta, which is in Atlanta, you know, major serious, you know, tennis league, uh, with some of them. And we played full sets matches, you know, the whole deal. And I served for like an hour straight, you know, every day for three days a week for a month. And after not ever having done that, my shoulder's done. Like I just, I killed it. <laughs> so, and it hasn't gone away and it's been a month. Um, and I did a month of no tennis. I did a month of stretching. Um, I'm like, Alex, I go get dry needling with the electrodes. I get, you know, the tens units on it. I get, you know, as much massage as I can. So what I need, what I think would be helpful is strengthening for those specific movements in tennis. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I know when I, I used to do softball and when you go to physical therapy, they teach you the strengthening so you can help make those joints, sorry, there's a loss, um, joints better and healthier so that you can do those um, repetitive actions and not injure yourself so much. Yeah, that's great. I agree with that one too. Con? So um, I'm very fortunate that Tennis haven't caused any issues to me. However, I keep an eye out because um, I hear left and right, elbow, uh, knee, foot, you know. So this is just really good to, for me to um, listen to everybody's um, information. That's what help me out in the future. Wonderful. 
can I just propose before anybody else maybe hangs up before we have to wrap it up that before we meet for our next call, if you plan on um, attending with us, uh, I'd really love it if you could do a chair audit or a sitting audit. And what that means is that the experiment is for, if you can, three days, if not seven days, track how many hours a day you sit in a chair. And that can be driving at a dinner table, at a desk, in the 90 degree position with your hips flexed at 90 degrees, like calculate that and track how many hours you sit um, daily for three to seven days. And then come prepared to share that with us um, on the next call if you're gonna join us. That would be interesting to see. <laughs> Dropping the hammer, Ruth. Dropping the hammer. I love the it. The reason the, the so the reason why is so much so well, we're gonna talk a lot about like what the impacts of sitting over time, but on average, Americans sit nine to thirteen hours a day in that position. Wow. Specific adaptations to depose to impose demands mean that the hip flexors get short and tight and that your glutes, that's a whole thing, right? So it's a really important audit. So it'd be an, just for your own curiosity and then for ours, do that um, sitting on it. Go ahead, Nick, sorry. I didn't no, want to forget awesome. that. That's awesome, I love it, I love it. Because I think that um, the knock-on effects are so dramatic, as far, especially as what it does to the foot if the hips aren't able to stabilize the foot. Because the main role of a lot of the hip muscles are to stabilize the foot. And if you can't stabilize the foot with the hips, stuff happens, bad stuff happens. And so a chair audit is a beautiful place to start and not like from a judgmental place. I think it's more about, you know, just what is, because I think the reality is we, a lot of us have non, you know, optional chair sitting that we often do. I don't know a restaurant or a car where you can drive and not sit down. Right. So like, <laughs> um, it's more about the, the, the optional chair sitting on the couches and you can, you know, pull a room. Don't, under, and, don't and, underestimate the, sorry, don't underestimate the the chair sitting on the upper body, shoulders, elbows, wrists too, which we'll talk more about over time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, guys, well, this is awesome. Thank you for, for taking an hour out of your day and, and showing up and uh, yeah, we'll be in touch. Um, we'll probably do this again. I think we'll do this maybe a couple of weeks. We'll have another conversation. We'll bring in the space, some some teaching, some learning, and um, you know the goal is really in a few months we're going to be releasing some short little sort of courses, products that you guys can participate in, and and um, so this is really for us to you to get to know us and for us to share a little bit about what we're doing. So thank you so much for being here, taking time yeah. out today. We really appreciate. it. And in closing, just thank you, thank you too, because we, 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 Nick and I are always together nerding out on this kind of stuff online, and it really is, it really is important to us to build community because there's so many different voices with so many different experiences and backgrounds. So we really hope to not only deliver good courses that can help people um, navigate their tennis lives, but also really building a robust community around this. So that's a real strong intention of ours as well. Thank awesome. you so much. Thank you guys. Thank you.